Uh, many thanks to the organizers also for inviting me and, and giving the possibility to give you a presentation. So indeed, I would like to talk about the testing. So the topics of my presentation, uh, first a few words on our company, then uh, some slides on industrial compostability uh, experiences and, and how, how does it work and what can we expect for the future. Then a few other words on home composting and biodegradation in other environments. And then finally on anaerobic digestion. I will try to not to repeat too many things which have been said already. Um, okay. So first uh, on our company. So this year we celebrate our 25 years. We're a kind of spin-off company from the University of Ghent. Uh, you see here some figures about 20 million euro per year uh, turnover. Uh, very uh, export oriented. Uh, and based in Belgium. Uh, with regard to the organization, we have two main divisions in the company. One division is an engineering division. Um, no. So this is uh, for anaerobic digestion. We built uh, AD plants. And then we have a second division, which is all kind of laboratory services and consulting services, also related to biogas, LCA, uh, ACS, but then also a lot on biodegradation and compostability testing. Now, with regard to this testing, uh, we try to be a one-stop laboratory so that whenever you have a question, uh, we can give you the answer. Sometimes we have to ask the help of friends. Often we can do it ourselves. We are very strictly independent. <clears throat> and I think this is very important because we see many laboratories which in fact are related to one company and yeah, we think this is not really co correct. We have a quality control system, which for laboratories is ISO 17025, so that is the same family as ISO 9000, ISO 14000, etc. This is for laboratories, and this is quite a hassle, I must say. Uh, but because of that, we are recognized by all certification bodies. We are also very active in standardization, and what is maybe more important is that we are strong believers in standardization. I think in the world of biodegradability and compostability, there is a lot of confusion sometimes created by companies, I would say, on purpose. Uh, and the only way to deal with that is by having standards, by uh, creating clear rules, the playing rules, so that these need to be objective. It is not always uh, an easy exercise. As a matter of fact, it can be quite difficult and time consuming, but we think it is very important. Uh, and then you see here with regard to the experience. So we have done testing for many companies. Uh, basic polymers like BASF, NatureWorks, Novamont, paper and board packaging, etc., etc. Interesting, we have also done quite some testing for uh, uh, oxo-degradable plastics and enzyme-mediated degradable plastics. Okay, if then we look to industrial compostability. Um, so first, an overview of the different standards which do exist. You see many standards. Two things which are important. One thing is they define tests and specifications, and that is a novelty. You have many standards who are saying how to test something, but they don't guide you what to do with the results. Not so with compostability, and this was something new, to be honest, about 20 years ago. There we say, okay, this is how you have to test it, and this is how the result have to be to be okay. And that was a, a kind of novelty. So the specifications, the criteria, are very important. And then the second thing which is important, you see that there are many standards, but they are very similar to one another. So um, let's say that with regard to the, can the content, there is about 90, 95% overlap. There are some differences in the details, I would say, uh, and, and I, I can, I can uh, tell about it, but I think the message to take home is that these norms do exist and they are all very similar. Now, okay, we've seen it already a couple of times, four basic elements, uh, chemical characteristics, ecotoxicity, then degradation, both biodegradation and disintegration. I think it is clear that they can be split in two groups. Uh, so two of the basic elements are related to environmental safety, two are related to degradation. So I think this is also a, a, a message to take home. When defining compostability, we have uh, the standardization groups have immediately said it must not only be degradable, it must also be safe for the environment. And uh, okay, this seems very logical, but I can, uh, we have some, uh, some products in our little museum in our office uh, from uh, compostable products which were perfectly degradable, but at the same time loaded with heavy metals because they had to be green. Uh, and then it was full of cadmium, and this is not precisely what you like in your compost. So both degradation and environmental safety. 
So then the logos which do exist, you have certification, okay, the previous pre presentation talked about it. So you have uh, also the OK Compost from Vensot, you have Japanese logos, Australian, then several logos, this is in Canada, Japanese, uh, Japan, so uh, many logos which do exist uh, to further organize and very importantly, create uh, credibility uh, so that there is no doubt about the compostability of these products. Now, does that mean that everything is solved? Uh, no, uh, we don't live in a perfect world. So uh, overall, there is a positive experience, but by doing, by, by working with standards, by working with certificates, and I think uh, Miriam can confirm, every day you get new problems. You get new questions, yeah, what to do with this, what to do with that. So that is, um, leads to the necessity to create bylaws. And uh, Dinserco calls it a certification scheme. What to do when you combine certified components? You have component A, which is certified, component B, which is certified. You combine them, you make a laminate. What do you need to test? Nothing, everything, just part of the testing. What, uh, so this needs to be defined. And that uh, is the necessity of bylaws. <coughs> Multi-layer structure, inks, what to do in the case of inks, additives. What to do in the case of a family of products? Can you certify a whole family at once or do you need to do some tests? So you see there are quite some practical questions which will uh, pop up when you, when you do the work, when you are busy. An important uh, issue which we have now for several months already is the duration for disintegration. As a matter of fact, also in Germany, this was being questioned last year. So the, the standard prescribes 12 weeks, and many composters say, this is too long, we compost in four to six weeks. The norm is not good because we are, uh, the 12 weeks is too long. And for example, cedar growth in uh, Seattle and USA is one advocate which is saying, uh, this is too long. Now, in reality, what are they doing? Um, so this is a typical composting process. You have bio-waste coming in, a pretreatment. Then you have an intensive composting phase, sieving, and then maturation before you have the compost. Now, and this process, this intensive composting, only lasts four, six weeks, and then they say, okay, the 12 weeks is too long because our intensive composting process is only three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever. However, what they forget to tell is that on, when they do the sieving afterwards, which is always the case, that the overflow is being recycled back to the beginning. So, uh, and, and in that sense, the, the typical duration is longer than the four, six weeks, which they are saying for the intensive composting, because you have this internal loop, uh, which is useful for some bioplastics, which are not gone after four weeks, but which is also needed for natural products. So if you are looking to little branches, little twigs, that's also not disappeared after four, six weeks, you also need this loop to degrade natural materials. So this is an important argument. And for example, in the Netherlands, we had precisely the same discussion and we explained to the composters in a meeting, look, this is how, it, how we see it, and how it, this is how it worked, do you agree? And they all agreed and they now uh, confirm that the 12 weeks testing is a good, is a good uh, duration. So here you see in the laboratory how we do the testing. So this is in pilot scale uh, composting vessels where we are checking the disintegration of these products. Some other issues which do exist, for example, in the, in the US again, uh, they do composting tests at very high temperatures, 75, 80 degrees C. Um, and, and then, of course, some products do not work anymore, so then they challenge the standard, the, the bad standard, because your product is not degrading in our system, which is working at 75 degrees C. But then it is, in fact, it is basic science with regard to composting. At that temperature, you don't have fungal activity anymore. Um, I can, I can assure you that PLA works very well at that temperature, but that, for example, a product like Bagasse, uh, or which, leads, uh, which, uh, which is quite rich in lignin, which needs the fungi to degrade, will not degrade at that temperature. But this is not, this is not a, a good composting temperature. But, okay, these are discussions which still do exist. Uh, with regard to heavy metals, there is a difference. Uh, you have seen from the previous presentation that in Australia they require earthworms. So in any case, the ambition must be that we have a good reciprocity between the different logos. So we use uniform standards, which can be the ISO standard. We, we need to use uniform schemes so that we interpret the standards. There is some interpretation needed. A standard is not, is not always giving the answer. It, it needs sometimes it needs interpretation. And we must make sure that we are interpreting it in the same way so that then uh, when the product is is declared compostable, that it will always be compostable in whatever region or in whatever system you are looking at it. And then you have the importance of geographical reputation. So I think each logo has a geographical value you, and, and they are known in countries, so this is uh, to be respected. 
Okay, this is a slide which I added after yesterday. I could not uh, resist the temptation. <laughs> um, a slide about oxo-degradable plastics. Um, so first of all, what are they? They are conventional polyolefins to which uh, pro-oxidantia have been added. So they are, these are transition metals which will stimulate uh, the biodegradation. Uh, with regard to industrial compostability, biodegradation, in my opinion, has not been demonstrated. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, you can even deduct it uh, from uh, results which have been published in nature. So this is a publication from Jakubovic uh, from Sweden, where you can see that the decrease in molecular weight, both the rate and the level at which it ends, are determined by temperature. So it is very typical that if you look to the results of the oxo-degradable people, uh, they do weathering at very high temperatures, and then you have the famous Arrhenius uh, equation. They say you can extrapolate to uh, low temperature, it's just a matter of time. But by this graph, you can see this is not true. Both the rate is different, but then also the level, at, at, it's not, a, it's not um, uh, a ceiling, it's like a bottom, where it is bottoming out, depends on the temperature. And therefore, um, it needs to be checked when it is bottoming out at, for example, a molecular weight of 8,000, 5,000. Is it then small enough to be biodegradable? Uh, we doubt it. And as a matter of fact, there is no proof. They, the, the results which you see, they show a few percent of biodegradation, but never high percentages of biodegradation. So the question is whether the decrease of molecular weight goes below a certain threshold value at which the small parts would degrade. Um, OK, this needs to be checked. So also, uh, OK, plant toxicity is OK, but disintegration, it is said to be OK, but um, OK, we have seen results that in composting, when there is no light, that the disintegration is insufficient. So they do not fulfill the requirements of the standards. They cannot be certified as being industrially compostable. And therefore, in our opinion, at best, they can be called photofragmentable or thermofragmentable but certainly nothing bio about it. Okay, if then we look to other environments, um, home composting and other things, another important uh, misunderstanding with regard to biodegradation is that people think in terms of black and white. They want to make it very easy, which is of course a good ambition, but sometimes life is not easy and you have to, to deal with the complex issues of life. And the thing is that biodegradation is very much depending on the environment and can be different from one environment to the other. So the norms which we have been discussing, the, the EN 13432, are about industrial composting, but the results cannot be applied to other environments such as soil, marine, water, etc., etc. Et so there is a kind of order of aggressiveness of environment. And um, the most aggressive environment is compost. Then you have soil, fresh water, marine water, and landfill. And there are two reasons. One is temperature. In industrial composting, you have always high temperature. It is mandatory. Otherwise, you lose your permit. You must do industrial composting at 60 degrees C, uh, which is, uh, of course, important for certain polymers. For PLA, it is well known. PLA needs a thermal trigger, so you need to be above the glass transition temp temperature and then it will start to biodegrade. So in industrial composting it works fine, but in other environments where you have ambient temperature, let's say on average 21 degrees C, uh, this will make be a difference. And it's not only PLA, there are also some other polymers where temperature can be important. And then a second factor is the biology which is involved, and more importantly the role of the fungi. If you want to degrade a difficult polymer, you need fungi. And fungi are active in compost and in soil, but they are not active in water. You can detect them in water, so people do, okay, we, we, we see fungi in water, okay, you can detect them, but they are not active. And as a matter of fact, this is well known, uh, for example, in archaeology. If you have swampy areas, you find back much more leather, hair, things which need fungi to degrade. They will remain for centuries in swampy areas and in, in inundated areas, while in soil, where fungi can be active, they are gone after a, a few decades. So this is also important. So, and then you can see if you make a kind of classification, uh, at the right side, you have aerobic conditions where fungi can uh, live. At the left side, you have uh, conditions like anaerobic or, uh, for example, also aquatic conditions where fungi are not active. And then you have temperature, high temperature, like in thermophilic digestion or in industrial composting, and low temperature. And then you see, for example, PLA will work here at the high temperature, will not work here. For some materials like mechanical pulp, like PBAT, you need fungi. They work at the right side of this uh, 
scheme, not at the left side. And then you have some other materials like, like chemical pulp, like PHA, that will degrade under all conditions. So it is quite important to, because sometimes still people don't realize they say something is biodegradable or something is not biodegradable. That's not a complete answer. You have to specify about what environment you are talking. And then you have the schemes, for example, like home composting. Uh, okay, you have some standards, you have the schemes. It has already been uh, presented in the previous presentation. You need to demonstrate that it works at ambient temperature. In soil, you have two uh, standards. Uh, for example, it has been mentioned already a couple of times. A mulching film is a very nice application for bioplastics. But of course, then it needs to biodegrade in soil. And you need to demonstrate that it works in soil. So in France, you have a norm. In Italy, you have a norm. You have a certification system, OK, biosoil. Uh, the main thing is that you need to demonstrate biodegradation in soil within a period of two years, 90%, because in soil, biodegradation will go slower. Disintegration is no part of these uh, norms and standards, because that is considered to be a product characteristic. It is the farmer who will say the mulching film has to disappear after three months, after six months, after nine months, because it will depend on the crop. It does not need to be included in a standard. You also have uh, norms on water, fresh water, and then also marine water. Uh, okay, this is an, a big uh, discussion now also, of course, uh, biodegradation and, and, and seawater. There is only one norm with specification, uh, ASTM D7081, which in my opinion is not really the best norm because you can uh, test biodegradation and compost and then extrapolate to marine conditions, which in fact is, is uh, not correct. But okay, this is the only norm which is existing at this stage. And then finally, a few words on anaerobic digestion. So anaerobic digestion is, of course, without oxygen, but then also with recovery of uh, biogas. Uh, this has been discussed already for many, many years. Uh, what about bioplastics and anaerobic digestions? And uh, since there is no answer, you can imagine that it is a difficult uh, discussion, and I can explain you why. Uh, the first reason is that in anaerobic digestion, you have very different technologies in contrast to composting. Composting is always more or less the same. Okay, the composters, they will not like uh, me saying that, but still, you can do it in containers, you can do it in windrows, you can blow in air, you can suck out air, but the basic principle is always the same. In anaerobic digestion, the differences are more important. For example, you have mesophilic digestion at 35 degrees C versus thermophilic digestion at 52 degrees C, which can be a very big difference. And then even more important, you have wet systems and dry systems, which deal in a completely different way with uh, waste, with plastics, with packaging. And um, for example, the wet systems, they are not really suited to deal with bioplastics because it needs to dissolve or, or disperse immediately. So there are very different systems. Um, okay. Now, if we look to AD and bioplastics, of course, the benefit is that besides organic recovery, the recovery of compost, you also have energy recovery. Of course, your LCA, poof, the results will be much, much better because you're also producing energy from your wet waste. So this is an important asset, at least if your material is also converted to biogas. Uh, but again, the importance of fungi, under anaerobic conditions, you don't have fungal activity, so the aggressivity is much less. So there are several polymers, those who need fungi to degrade, who will not degrade under anaerobic conditions. So the results can be quite, quite different. Uh, and with regard to standards, there are, at this moment, there is no specific standard on anaerobic digestion, no useful guidelines. The only thing uh, which does exist is an EN13432 as an option. Uh, you must demonstrate 50% biodegradation after two months and also disintegration after five weeks combined anaerobic aerobic because most anaerobic systems, anaerobic digestion systems, they are a combination of a first phase which is anaerobic and a second phase which is aerobic. So do you really need the conversion to biogas? Um, to be honest, uh, we think it is not. You can also have plastics and packaging which are compatible with anaerobic digestions, meaning that they, they technically they can be, be treated by an anaerobic digestion system without necessarily being converted to biogas. So therefore, uh, we think that one standard with one set of criteria is uh, probably not the, the, the way to go. Uh, on the other hand, if you can demonstrate that also biogas is produced, that it is converted to energy, this is an important asset which is important to include in your results. 
So we think the best solution is uh, one standard with various options or different standards. So that is mesophilic without biogas production. So that means that your plastic can be treated in a mesophilic uh, digestion system without biogas being produced. So let's say maybe the low level. Then a better system would be that it is also converted to biogas. And then you have the equivalent under thermophilic uh, conditions. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your Thank you, Bruno. Uh, before I open the discussion, let me take the privilege of a chairman and ask you the first question. Uh, if we want it or not, every day uh, in various parts of our roads, the polyethylene uh, with the oxo additives decompose and creates the polyethylene dust. This dust, uh, accumulates because the rate of its further degradation is relatively slow. What we have observed even in our laboratories that because in this dust still there is the catalyst who promote the photodegradation, this catalyst is again active and promotes cross-linking. Such cross-linking causes that the rate of further degradation is even longer because it's much more difficult to uh, degrade the cross-link material. So my question is, do you have any uh, information about the, uh, or, uh, about the studies concerning the structure and degradation of this uh, polyethylene dust, which is formed in this case? Because this is the problem which now becomes more and more difficult to resolve. Um, yes, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not really a polymer scientist, so I don't think I can really answer your question. However, uh, what we do see, and, and this is what uh, I wanted to show in, in, uh, in this slide, uh, and this is, a, this is a, a test which was done by Jakubovic, you see that, that normally, I, the, the reasoning which they normally say is you have the catalyst and the molecular weight, it will continue, continue, it's always smaller, smaller, smaller. Uh, but this is not true. You see that it is exactly. bottoming out, so it is, it is reaching a level and not decreasing any further so you anymore. Have, you have and that the macro probably, observation. Yeah. That is the, probably the cross-linking which you are talking about, so mm -hmm. that at a given moment, the, I, I often use the image of a bicycle chain. Mm -hmm. uh, a polymer is like a bicycle chain, and it will be cut and cut and cut and cut in smaller pieces, but at a given moment, the pieces do not become smaller anymore. Exactly. And that is the, the, the bottom which you reach which is above the threshold value for biodegradation and which can be also explained by the cross-linking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions to Bruno? If not, let us thank uh, Bruno de Ville again for the excellent presentation.